This panel that we're going to have now is extremely timely. The last uh, couple of months have been uh, really uh, revolutionary for the Committee to Protect Journalists. You know, we've been sitting around in our meetings for years coming about uh, tweeting and we have to get more internet and we have to do this and that. But it really exploded with a vengeance in the last couple of months in the Middle East. And I have to say that as someone who's watched the committee for years, uh, we really did what we were set up to do. And uh, I urge you to look at the website. Uh, I think we recorded some 140 or so attacks in Egypt. Uh, we were able to do it in a timely fashion uh, because, uh, and thus protect people. And much of this had to do with the existence of social media and the ability of people to reach us in what we used to consider unconventional ways. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, about, uh, hearing from the people on the panel because this is really the direction that the committee and journalism in general is taking. We have an excellent moderator in Jacob Weisberg who has been uh, very generous over the last few years in lending his time to the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, he's shared things for us, he's spoken to us, he's one of our, he's sort of like a man from another planet who's come down and said, yes, this is the internet. <laughs> Yet he appears to be one of us. <laughs> uh, just briefly, he's the chairman of the Slate Group, whose roster includes Slate, The Root, and the video site Slate 5, or V. V, excuse me. Uh, as well as one print journal, Foreign Policy. He has a bi-weekly opinion column that's published in Slate. Uh, he's a well-known political writer, editor. He works in the New Republic, Slate, Times Magazine, etc., and has written a number of books, including The Bush Tragedy in an Uncertain World, which he co-wrote with uh, Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin, and In Defense of Government. So I'm not going to do any more to uh, define the, the panel. I think uh, Jacob will do that. And welcome to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. I used to relish my role as, as a man from the future, but I'm now paradoxically an old man of the internet, uh, having worked on the internet for 15 years. But thank you all for coming or staying, as the case may be. Um, we're, this is going to be a great conversation. I've really been looking forward to it. I want to start by introducing our, our panelists. Um, to my left is uh, Sheila Coronel. Um, Sheila began her reporting career at the Philippine publication Panorama, and she's worked for the New York Times, The Guardian. In 1989, she and her colleagues founded the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. She's now the director of the St Stable, you say Stable, Stabile Center for Investigative Journalism, and the Stabile Professor of Investigative Journalism right here at the Columbia J School. Um, she is also the author and editor of more than a dozen books including Coups, Cults, and Cannibals. That was my favorite title. Um, next to her, sorry, I've got these out of order on my iPad, is Nazila Fathi, um, who was based in Tehran, Tehran as a correspondent for the New York Times from 2001 until 2009 when she was forced to leave the country because of threats against her. Um, she's now a Neiman Fellow at Harvard this year, and she's been a guest speaker on numerous uh, panels and programs on CNN, BBC, PBS, and her articles have appeared in Foreign Policy, for which I'm always happy to put in a plug, and the New York Review of Books. Um, next to Nazila is Rebecca McKinnon, uh, who is the former CNN correspondent in Beijing and Tokyo, and a leading uh, authority on internet censorship in China and elsewhere. She lives now in Washington, D.C., where she is the Schwartz Fellow at the New America Foundation, she uh, is the co-founder of the citizen media organization Global Voices Online, which advocates free expression. She has a book coming out next year on all the stuff we're going to be talking about today, and she is, importantly, a CPJ board member. Um, and to Rebecca's left is Ahmad Shahab Eldin. Did I say that right? The first part was off. It's fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, he had a, he had a, um, I'm going to try to find it quickly here. He had an official um, uh, bio, but I found his uh,
Twitter bio, which I liked even better, so I'm going to read that instead. Um, Ahmed is Palestinian by blood, American by birth, Kuwaiti by family refuge, Egyptian by upbringing, Austrian by adolescence, and curious by nature. <laughs> He's a journalist. The last part says journalist. I don't know how true. It's probably the least true, but. <laughs> <laughs> Those, um, the Twitter bios are an I interesting exercise in, uh, in self-portraiture. And I should say that, uh, that everyone on this panel has a Twitter handle, and maybe at the end of it, if you want to follow any of us, we'll tell you, tell you what they are. Seems appropriate today. Um, I should also say, though, that Ahmed is the co-producer, uh, is the producer and the co-host of something called The Stream, which is a web community which is going to have its own daily TV show on Al Jazeera English starting in May. Um, and he's, he's done a lot of other stuff, include, including working on the PBS Wide Angle program, the New York Times, and he has uh, been a blogger for the Huffington Post World section, which is, I gather, how you pay for your other work, right? Of so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, <laughs> uh, lastly, um, Danny O'Brien uh, joined the Committee to Protect Journalists as the Internet Advocacy Coordinator in April 2010. Uh, I believe he is the only CPJ staff member who's figured out how to have his job based in San Francisco. Yes. Um, before that, he was a journalist covering technology and culture for Wired UK, The New Scientist, Sunday Times of London, The Irish Times. Uh, he used to work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a very important organization dealing with internet freedom and privacy issues. Um, and uh, he is also the co-founder of something called the Open Rights Group, with, which is a British grassroots digital organization. Um, all right, so let's get started. And I want to start by asking, not in the same order, uh, each of our panelists a question or two, just to sort of start drawing them out. Feel free to jump in at any point and, and, and mix it up. I want this to be as much of a conversation as possible, and we will try to save a little time for questions at the end. Um, Rebecca, I want to start with you. Um, you know, when we look at, at repressive regimes, illiberal regimes, um, however you want to put it, I think we tend to assume that the level of Internet freedom probably mirrors other levels of freedom or, or censorship in the society. But that's not necessarily true, right? I mean, there, there are places where activists are particularly good at getting around censorship, and there are places where the government is particularly adept at, at preventing freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. So just to get us started, could you give us a little sense of the sort of state of Internet freedom around the world? I mean, where right. is it, you know, where is it better? Where is it worse? Well, before taking you on a world tour, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think I first need to, to walk you through sort of the categories of challenges that both professional journalists and citizen journalists and anybody trying to speak online, uh, the, the, the challenges and restrictions and, and attacks that, that people face because uh, it's multifarious and getting more complicated all the time. And so before you can even start talking about what country yeah. is worse than which and what people are doing, it, we first need to establish what we're talking about. So just to, just to start, um, oftentimes what people think of uh, when they think about Internet restrictions, restrictions on freedom of expression online, they're thinking about what is something that uh, the Open Net Initiative that studies Internet censorship and surveillance around the world call first generation Internet controls. So, for instance, the blocking of websites, mm. censorship, or if you have a website and the police call you up and say, remove this content, right? Just the, the very kind of standard censorship that, that I, I think is what most people tend to think about. But there are now what the Open Net Initiative likes to call second and third generation internet controls that get us into a very, very complex set of challenges, and every single country is different. So uh, you have some countries where you, know, you, you have classic internet censorship, um, but not too much else. You have other countries where you don't actually have classic internet censorship much at all, but you have some of these other things happening. So let me give you examples of some of the other things that take place. One is that you could have a website and then it just comes under attack by hackers yeah. and you have no idea who they are. Like a denial except of service Except they seem attack. to be kind yeah. of, right, a denial yeah. of service attack, except, you know, it, it seems to be, be done by people who support the government, but nobody can quite tell who they are and there's 
you know, it's totally on it. So uh, denial of service attack. Uh, you, you have um, a, a trend whereby uh, governments deploy both technical and legal uh, constructs to restrict speech, and sometimes a combination of the two. So in a lot of countries, increasingly, you have what's known as intermediary censorship and surveillance, whereby the government holds companies responsible and liable for everything their users are doing on a service. And this is done particularly in China because they're blocking outside companies. And so, so the, the internet companies in China are expected to censor and surveil users in a very finely grained way, and governments try and Im impose this kind of liability on foreign or international companies as well as their services intersect through particular jurisdictions. Um, so you have that. You have the use of law enforcement mechanisms and intellectual property control protection mechanisms, child protection mechanisms, uh, also technical uh, technical setups um, that are meant to help law enforcement catch criminals who use mobile networks, all of these mechanisms can also be turned against political dissidents. Uh, so you have a, a set of these types of mechanisms being utilized across the world. Uh, you also have uh, surveillance that is uh, increasingly pervasive. Um, so. And, and this, this is happening, you know, again, across political systems, across legal systems, uh, whereby not only do you have uh, authorities accessing the internet service providers and the mobile providers, but you increasingly have uh, sophisticated uh, techniques like deep packet inspection, uh, it's called, which is actually being promoted in Western countries as a way to catch file sharing. Uh, but it's also very, very helpful to uh, regimes like the former Tunisian government and the Chinese government in tracking precisely what people are doing online. Uh, you also have increasingly proactive measures whereby governments are astroturfing the internet with pro-government uh, pro uh, uh, conversations and information while they're censoring the critical stuff. And you also have very sophisticated campaigns sometimes online and throughout the more conventional media as well to discredit dis dissidents. So, 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 so basically that there, there will be an effort. So for instance, uh, in uh, Azerbaijan, there was a, uh, a media organization that just did a story about, look, here are all the Azeri journalists who have Armenian friends on Facebook. What traitors are they? And, you know, kind of going through. Uh, and, and creating sort of a smear campaign a, against people. So increasingly governments are being more and more proactive. So the question about how do journalists get around all this stuff, uh, it's like, you know, where, where to start? Right, you have, a, you, um, <laughs> you have a cat and mouse game that's gotten infinitely right. more sophisticated. Yeah. But let me, um, let me ask you, Ahmed, in, you know, in relation to Egypt, I mean, is it too crude to say, Egypt may have been different because you had an opposition that was extremely sophisticated in the way it used the internet and social media in particular, and you had a government that was a little clumsy and, and behind the eight ball and it, the government lost. Yeah, I, I think that would be fair to say, and I think what's particularly interesting about Egypt, like within that framework is, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll start and preface it by saying I grew up in Egypt for 10 years when I was really young, and I remember I was using ICQ, you know, and now it's crazy to see how far we've all come, especially with what's happened. Yeah. I think Is Israeli technology, isn't it? Yes, what? it was. Was it? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Used to be. <laughs> yeah, wow. Sorry, for no, it's true. Yeah, it's yeah. true. Um, I think with regards to the opposition in Egypt, I think what, what worked to their favor was the fact that they took time to kind of feel out their online kind of organization and mobilization effort. Because all these social, you know, tools and all these online tools, they essentially only work if, you know, it can translate into the streets. So with regards to the revolution, what, for example, what al Ghanim did is even though he had 350,000 followers on Facebook, and even though, you know, Egypt was different than Tunisia in the sense that in Tunisia it was targeted fishing operations. Right. So as you were saying, you know, they were you're targeting specific people and hacking into their accounts, stealing their passwords in order to pre prevent dissent. 
and mobilization. And it's also worth mentioning Tunisia has a much higher internet penetration rate. I think it's around 25 percent. Egypt is about 20 percent. The reason I bring all this up is because once Tunisia fell, in Egypt you saw a kind of, um, a lot of people like to think that it was just, uh, you know, mobilization online and all of a sudden that translated into four million people in Tahrir Square. What happened is it was a very well planned and thought out, and it's, this is often not reported in the press, yeah. um, strategic alliance, not just with other local opposition and dissident groups in Egypt, but also with people across the region, with people who have skills, uh, with people such as uh, groups like Anonymous and hacktivist groups, reaching out to them in order to uh, kind of embolden their cause and also feel out, you know, 350,000 people can sit on a Facebook page and talk all they want about why they're unhappy. And what you need to do is you need to find common ground and that's what happened. And I think they also started to do things like field tests where they went into the streets and they went to certain neighborhoods and communities where people didn't have access to these tools, where they weren't part of these Facebook groups. And so I know this is perhaps not exactly like uh, answering the question at this point, but it's worth mentioning that that is what succeeded, I think, in allowing uh, the, the eventual revolution to happen by going into these areas and using, you know, we talk about social media and it's kind of funny because a pamphlet in a sense is social media. I mean, the Gutenberg press is social media. It's 1.0 or maybe 0 0.5 or 0.2. But, you know, you have to kind of, and it's, it's, it's kind of making everything available and being as inclusive as you can be. Um, and that's what they did. You know, they went and took pamphlets and give it, gave them to the less poor, the people who didn't have, or the poor, the people who didn't have access to certain technologies. And that's how they knew that they'd had power in numbers. And uh, I think that's what allowed them to. Yeah, uh, Nazila, if, if Egypt is an example of where the opposition used technology more effectively and won, Iran is often pointed to as an example of a place where, where the regime used technology very effectively in the end to suppress opposition, to, to, to infiltrate, to spy, to, to censor more effectively. Um, one poll in this debate is, is usually defined by um, Evgeny Mazarov, who I think points to Iran frequently as an example of why, you know, this is sort of counterexample for the cyber utopians. I mean, he thinks Iran shows that the government may be a more effective user of social media and of other technology tools than, than people who want more, more freedom or liberalization. Do you see it that way? I think it's much more complicated than that. Uh, first of all, the way the social media was used in, in Egypt was never used in Iran. Uh, the role of social media, specifically the Twitter and Facebook, was highly exaggerated um, in Iran. Um, because that was a whole two years ago. I mean, it was like a, year a different thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, I think the numbers came out at that time. Twitter had just like a few thousand registered users in Iran. It became yeah. clear that a lot of tweets that were coming out on Iran were not, in fact, coming out of uh, people who were uh, in, inside the country. Uh, yeah. Facebook did play a role in informing people before the election. Uh, election candidates used it uh, very efficiently. Uh, but and I, I, I totally agree that the government also used the internet uh, by slowing it down, by shutting it down, to cripple the movement. But it was not just that. Uh, uh, more than that, it was how it jammed uh, satellite TV, how it jammed uh, radio, uh, uh, radio programs beamed inside the country. I mean, about, about over th 30 million people have access to internet, but not all these Internet users are political. They don't all, they don't all check out uh, uh, political websites or follow news on Facebook. Uh, a lot of them are people who are just doing emails. Uh, the majority of people who get their information are people who watch the news on satellite television or opposition uh, television channels. And the government, in fact, disconnected people from news, from information, by jamming these programs first. Internet is still accessible in Iran. Uh, there are lots of filtering. There's a lot of blocking. But there are also a lot of sophisticated uh, uh, geeks who are coming up with various temporary or much more long-term uh, solutions to, uh, to, to circumvent the restrictions. Uh, it, it has played both ends. Internet, since early 2000, became a place where uh, political analysts, journalists started posting their analysis. Uh, news information, and it was from the internet that newspapers or even satellite television started picking up the information. 
and it, it became a major platform for discussing serious issues. Uh, nowhere else could activists or uh, uh, journalists write about these things. Newspapers were being shut down. Uh, the government, I mean, as you mentioned, it started its, uh, its crackdown. Uh, on the other hand, it also started another measure, and that was a lot, it, it started paying a lot of hardline forces to start their own blogs. Right. And that has even become a very interesting uh, platform to hear what these guys have to say. Uh, on February 14th, for example, when internet was slowed down, a lot of people inside the country were, were having difficulty to post their videos or, or, or their accounts of what was happening on the street. A couple of these uh, hardline uh, militia members who had taken part in, in, in beating up people, they posted their accounts of what was happening. So that's interesting. On the one hand, it's it's propaganda for the regime. On the other hand, it provides some insight into into what the, what the what they're thinking. Exactly. Yeah. It it has both the television and the internet have provided news. It has provide they have provided uh, analysis. And when people have access to information, when they learn about realities, uh, they started making wiser choices. And I think that's what matters. The biggest difference between Iran and Iran in 2009 and Egypt uh, this year was that the Iranians came out uh, in huge numbers, in much larger numbers than in Egypt. I mean, at one point, the government acknowledged that there were three million people out on the streets. They didn't come out to stage a revolution. They still do not want to stage a revolution. Mm -hmm. But the, the Egyptians came out with an agenda to overthrow Mubarak. Iranians, to, to this date, are still reluctant to do that. And they, I mean, after the fall of Mubarak, they started making comparison between Iran in 1979 and Egypt in 2010, which was clearly irrelevant. But it shows their fear of political instability, that they do not want to have uh, a sort of uh, breakdown of political institutions. So that was the biggest uh, difference. Iranians still do not have an agenda to overthrow the regime. They do not have a leadership to do that. Yeah. Um, Sh Sheila, turning to you, you were, you were covering the revolution in the Philippines in 1986. There was no Facebook. There was no Twitter. There was no internet. How on earth did they have a revolution? I was, I, um, it's was, unimaginable. <laughs> but but, but in keeping with the theme here, was there, <laughs> and did you think at the time that there was technology, particularly media technology, that played a important role in making, making what happened there happen? All right. First of all, um, let me just say that uprisings don't just happen. There's usually a long period of years and decades of misery and suffering and people organizing that precedes these uprisings, and we tend to forget that in the rapture of the moment. In, in the Philippines, that was certainly the case. And while you know, uh, the, the revolution against Marcos was largely you know, empowered by a radio station, how old-fashioned can that be, and a Catholic radio station at that, which uh, did the role that Twitter and Facebook did of mobilizing people, calling them up, calling them to the streets, you know, and, and the term people power was actually the cardinal, cardinal sin, unfortunate name of the <laughs> Philippines, um, saying, you know, I urge you to show your power as a people. And so it became the people power revolution because this was after a fraudulent election, mm -hmm. which Marcos cheated brazenly. And the opposition was preparing for a long, long um, battle. And Cardinal Sin just said, you know, there was, it's too complicated to explain, but there was a pivotal moment when a coup was discovered <coughs> and the coup plotters were um, holed up in the military camp, and Cardinal Singh just said, go out there and show your power as a people, and people just went out there and didn't leave until Marcus had left. But the sentiments of the people was crystallized over a long period, starting maybe from 1983 when um, an opposition senator was assassinated, and there were daily demonstrations in the streets of Manila. Radio certainly played a key role, but over that long period, there were underground publications, there was alternative media, there were women's magazines played a very important role as well, because nobody bothered to censor them. And you had women journalists would put in, you know, stories about human rights abuses in between stories about movie stars and recipes. Hmm. And, and, this, and, and so it was a conscientization period over a fairly protracted uh, period of time. Yeah. 
Um, Danny, you know, a lot, of, a, a lot of people in our world wa watch all of this, and they're clearly rooting for the technology. <laughs> and they're... Not, they're, the, not they're, the people, just, just well, the Well, they're in favor of the well. people because they prove how great the technology is. Right. You know, it proves how, how, how powerful it is. But, I mean, when you're looking at that sort of, you know, stepping a little bit out of that, you know, uh, Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley kind of bubble view of it, um, how crucial do you think social media, Facebook in particular, was to what happened in Egypt and what happened in, in Tunisia and what might happen in other places? Do you think, I mean, to put it bluntly, that what, what, what happened in Egypt could have happened without Facebook or was it in some sense fundamentally enabled by it? I'm, I'm, so first of all, I should say, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert on yeah. individual countries or sort of alternate universes either. So it's very, it's very, it's very hard to tell, right? Whether, but you're, you're, a, you're a blogger, so you comment on everything. Right, that's right. But not being an expert, I will nonetheless hold forth. Um, I, 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 think the key th I think one of the key things here, right, I, th I think there would have been, that this was clearly something that was ready to happen. And the thing that really ultimately inspired Egypt was what happened in Tunisia and so forth. That's, that's, that's ultimately the chain of, of causality that we can, we can really easily point to. But I think one of the things that we can try and sort of match to the use of the technology is just how successful these things are. I mean, I think one of the, one, one of the key points with Egypt was that and, you know, this is one of the functions of journalists in this sort of environment, is you try and collect all the different points of view that are going on, and you, and you retransmit that to your audience, and your audience isn't passive, right? You've got people sitting there at home watching this many thousands of miles away, but you also have increasingly in a world where we, we have satellite TV and people can, can travel and read what people are saying on the other side of the world, uh, that, that audience is active, right? The, 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 the politicians in Egypt are watching this. The, the, um, the military are watching it. And I think one of the, the things that, that really impressed me the most about how Egypt, the Egyptian protesters were using the technology was their ability to get that side of the message out. If you, if you sat side by side watching Al Jazeera and Egyptian state media, I mean, these, at that time, it was clearly a different world. And one of the things that enables having those different sets of opinions is satellite TV. That's, you know, that's, that's, I guess that's an ancient technology now, but it's a transformative one because people can put up satellite dishes and get alternative opinions that, that aren't the dominant ones in, in Iran or even, the, you know, in the United States. Um, at the same time, the new innovation that, that caught, I think, a lot of people's eyes were people were, 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 were tweeting, were posting video from the square. And that was a deliberate attempt by those activists. They were actively, I mean, you could watch them discussing this, right? One of the things they wanted to ensure that they could do was that they could get out the message that they were a peaceful process Pro, uh, protest to the military because the military needed to hear that from them and not from the, the Mubarak uh, regime who, who had this, this, this alternative message. And when I watched the, the postings and, and, and the conversation that was going on social net, uh, uh, the social networks, it seemed to me that, that you know, I wasn't necessarily the audience there. Uh, the audience was the, the other forces within society who wanted reassurance or knowledge about what exactly this chaos was that was going on. And, and, and it, it worked both, both ways, right? Of course, the military were texting the protesters. They were texting everyone. Yeah. They were saying, OK, this is the Supreme Council of the military, and here's what we think right now. And one of the earliest meetings of the, the bloggers and the, 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 the geeks who were in Tahrir Square and, and the military after the regime fell was this little pooling where, they, where the, they were saying, you know, you have to be less ambiguous in your text messages, right? Because they were sending out these things saying, uh, we all want to be happy and, and <laughs> there shouldn't be any um, uh, violence. And the protesters were going, is this, are they just going like, to start fabricating violence and then attack us? Or is this a genuine statement? And so, you know, the military was sitting there learning how to fit 140 character messages as much as anyone else. Well, I mean, help me distinguish between, you're a social media person, help me distinguish between three things and maybe other things that yeah. social media does. One is information in, right? Yeah. I mean, it is, it is a way people inside the country find out yeah. things that are going on that they might have, not have to do. 
Another is information out. Mm -hmm. It's a way people in the rest of the world find out what's going on in this very exciting minute-by-minute minute mm -hmm. way. Um, and then the third one, which is, you know, the sort of Wailgonim thing, yeah. is, you know, actually organizing Organ opposition. Yeah. And, you know, and maybe there are others. But Using I mean, information to organize, perhaps. Yeah. The third thing. Um, one thing I actually just quickly wanted to yeah. comment on with regards to what, what you were saying is, I think it's overly simplistic to say, but ultimately what this all comes down to is access to information. And that, I think, yeah. speaks a bit to your question. You know, at the beginning, uh, uh, it was interesting because a lot of the conversation kind of was about what are we going to call this revolution, and if we do call it a Twitter revolution, uh, Twitter Tunisia revolution, which I think was just maybe a lazy thing as well on journalist's part because there's alliteration in there and sometimes <laughs> we just, you know, we like that. But the point is, I think, on a serious note, you know, it doesn't matter what we call this. What really matters is the lessons that we can learn, not just as journalists, but as users of this technology. Um, and the reason I say this is because the democratization that we're seeing, so to speak, in the Middle East is directly related to the democratization of media in general, which means us, unfortunately, as journalists, are no longer no longer have exclusivity. Um, and so often journalists, I think that's why uh, it was difficult for a lot of mainstream networks to cover this at the beginning because of budget issues and because they just ha didn't have the outreach and we were fortunate as Al Jazeera to have some of that. But there were so many ways in which information was being shared. And I think this is to answer your question. Whether it was information being shared from someone in Egypt to someone else in Egypt, from someone in Tunisia to someone in Egypt, or, you know, whether it was tweets, whether it was, uh, you know, Facebook, again, organization and posts, whether it was reaching out to groups like, ha like Anonymous and asking them to intervene in order to kind of, uh, you know, help send your message. Uh, even when the internet was shut down in Egypt, which it's probably worth mentioning that the very same day, I thought this was mine, the very same day <laughs> that, um, this very same day that President Obama was fielding questions on YouTube, uh, from, you know, his public and exercising democracy is the exact same day Mubarak shut down the internet. Now, when he did that, it's not just journalists that were affected. And in the previous panel, it was very interesting because there was a lot of focus on journalists. And I understand, obviously, we're here at the Committee to Protect Journalists. I mean, that's, that makes sense. But the reality is, a lot of the conversations and a lot of what I think influenced how things evolved and how people received information didn't come from journalists. Right. Well, in, in this situation, it sort of becomes the Committee to Protect Journalism. Yeah, right, because you know, right. your definition, the, the, the official definition of someone as a journalist is not, is not, it doesn't necessarily have that much overlap between who's getting information out independently. And who's giving it. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's why on the previous panel when I believe Terry Anderson, you know, said, well, journalism, and he put it in quotes, I mean, I think it's really interesting because it's very, very difficult these days to define what is a journalist. And, and one of the last things I'll say is, you know, when our, our correspondents, you know, their licenses were revoked and they were detained um, in Egypt after the internet was shut down. I mean, essentially, we were not allowed to practice journalism, quote unquote, because we were no longer welcome. And they continued to do so. And the way in which they did was by, you know, tweeting uh, and, you know, updating people via text. And, you know, when they couldn't access t t Twitter, what they did is they found, you know, a friend who perhaps they trust or someone who they had, you know, spent, you know, let them crash on their couch a couple months earlier, just a trusted source essentially, and they just started texting them or using landlines in order to call them, give them information. And, you know, it, it's just, it's very, I think, informative to, to me and I think to us all to look at the ways in which journalists are using these tools. Um, when they're supposed to be reporting or when they even have access because even you know people were tweeting even before the internet was shut down and the way in which information is relayed and and how that kind of can can exist on an exponential level once it's you know people there were people once the internet was shut down who were living in London you know instead of going to the gym or going to have a drink or do whatever they wanted to do they were so captured by the story that they started volunteering, you know, their times. Hey, you know, between 12 and 6 p.m. today, here's an email address or here's my phone number. Text me. You know, I'll relay, I'll tweet on your behalf. I mean, I was monitoring the social networks primarily because for our show, uh, the stream, that's what my job was. Uh, I'm going to stop rambling, but the last thing I'll say is it was essentially, it was essentially really informative to me to see how people who had no reason to be involved in this conversation on either side, whether it's creating, you know, giving out information or not, wanted to get involved and found ways of getting involved that were extremely creative and I think helped move the story forward.
It's a very good point, and also the speed with which people improvise this, as you say, this text to tweet or phone to tweet technology, which is a way of getting around, right. around the shutdown. But let me ask you about that, Rebecca. I mean, both in, in at least two instances, in Egypt and Libya, the government has, has tried, with some, some success, to shut down the internet, which is something that I sort of naively assumed was, you know, long, no longer really possible, that, you know, there wasn't really like a master switch you could pull to just turn the damn thing off. But, you know, if that is a real issue we face, mm -hmm. how do we deal with that? How do we get well, around that? You know, it, it, it probably is much harder, maybe impossible, to shut down the Internet in the United States because the con government's control over networks is not as centralized right. and things are much more distributed mm -hmm. uh, and so on. But in countries like Egypt and, and Libya, even more so, the government has direct control over all the internet service providers and telecommunications companies. And it's, it, all you need is to make a few phone calls. You will shut this down or it will go badly for you. And it's off, you know. Uh, so um, th this tells us a lesson um, about the centralization of networks uh, and, and also just the, the, the way in which regulatory systems and legal systems are so important in affecting ultimately whether networks remain open and distributed enough for people to use or do you have a situation and you know Tim Wu in his book The Master Switch talks about this you know if 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 your channels for communication are very centralized even if they are through a private sector company that it's it's a very you know small bottlenecks and and easy choke points yep. and you have a powerful government uh, and a weak legal system, or not much of one, or one that just serves the government, it's very easy to turn everything off. And, and so it, it kind of comes back down to uh, things that are not that technical, but which combine with the technology, law, regulation, business structures, uh, and so on, of course, because you know the internet is not this thing that just lives in the ether, right? It's right. going through pipes. Um, so like in, in China, the internet, the global internet enters China at eight or nine points. And so that makes it much easier to control than if you have a more distributed uh, situation going on. So, I mean, a lot of this seems to keep coming back to the point that, you know, fostering technology without fostering civil society is unlikely mm -hmm. to get you that far. You know, and, then in, and in fact, the more important role of the technology may mm -hmm. be in supporting the civil society. Yeah, well, well, this is why I tend to find this whole debate about the internet is better for the good guys or better for the bad guys, it, to, just to be kind of a little bipolar and a little useless, yeah. um, and, and kind of prevents us from figuring out how to solve real problems for real people. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, it's about specifically what are the conditions in a particular mm -hmm. country right. You know, what, what are the commercial conditions, what, what are the economic conditions, what are the regulatory legal conditions, you know, so, all these things. Uh, and, and so the answer is different in every country and it changes year to year. Um, and, and so this is, this is what we, we, we need to keep in mind and, and absolutely protections for civil society. And again, it comes down to law. Do, do people have the right to speak their minds without getting thrown in jail ab arbitrarily. And that actually affects the way in which commercial networks get regulated and whether or not civil society is able to use these technologies. Danny either violently agrees or violently yeah. disagrees with I, you. I, 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 I always, I always yeah. very violently agree with Rebecca. The really important thing that keeps coming back is every country is different. And we've been doing this now, as you said, for 15 years now. The internet has, has slowly been integrating itself into all of these many cultures. And really, we've, we've stopped, we've stopped uh, having that discussion about, you know, is it helping the good guys more or the bad guys more? And, you know, one of the reasons why I do what I do at, at the Committee to Protect Journalists is that there's a whole stack of incredibly practical problems that attacks on the internet or, or uh, controls on the internet have for working journalists in repressive regimes or any other kind of regime where journalists are, are traditionally in danger. Tunisia, Egypt, Iran were all 
absolutely and fundamentally different. When we were dealing with Tunisia, we were sitting there trying to reverse engineer how the Tunisian government was getting the passwords and accounts of, of journalists and, and their sources and activists across the place. And that was, an, that was an entirely novel thing that was going on there. In Egypt, we were spending time talking to, 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 to hackers and, and engineers, watching the internet disappear finding out where it wasn't disappeared, where it was still going, and then marshalling journalists and, and again their sources and, and, and anybody else who was, who, who was actively working in the process of journalism in Egypt to make sure that they had a connection. In Libya, it's something completely different. Uh, and, and, uh, I mean, in Libya, you start with the problem that you have a much lower proportion of the population connected to the internet yeah, absolutely, at all. I mean, absolutely. Not, I mean, uh, you know, but, yeah. That's not to say that it changes the conversation. Sorry to jump yeah, yeah, in, but I just yeah. want to say, even though people aren't necessarily reporting from Libya, whether it's journalists or you know activists or whatnot, yeah. there's something that's different than with with Egypt and Tunisia, where you have Libyan activists and Libyans uh, now in the diaspora and America being maybe even more active than some of the Egyptians were or than other people were with regards to Egypt and Tunisia. And I think what you're starting to see is obviously you need to get footage or you know raw material you need to basically s see the story happen on the ground but that's not to say that it's not just as powerful or just as influential for people um, you know that are abroad to be contributing to the story and and, and unearthing truths from the abroad I mean, it's, out part, yeah, it's, yeah. Po it's possible it's, yeah. it's obviously not the same but yeah talk just talk a little more just as maybe it's a good moment to do it I want to hear a little more about the stream this project you're working on and how that how that figures into all of this yeah um, without like trying to plug my show too much um, yeah. the, Go ahead. the reason right. it's relevant I'll talk about how it's relevant because it really is I was uh, in December late December and early January in DC starting to troll kind of Twitter and trying to come up my boss said to me uh, you uh, have to kind of figure out how we're gonna create this show because the idea was we were gonna create a show about social media was a talk show uh, and we wanted to tap into these communities so to speak and find out what conversations are really important what are people really talking about um, obviously it would have to fit within Al Jazeera's purview of you know what's editorially re relevant but we really want this show and it is going to be a show where our editorial um, kind of a talking points and the content of the show is going to be informed by people uh, people people's conversations on Twitter and Facebook and whatnot so what's important is in late December, after I think a week after, two weeks after Mohammed Bouazizi uh, set himself on fire on the 18th, I kind of started to look, and I have an interest in Middle East politics and you know in Middle Eastern affairs. So I was looking across the networks, and I saw students are talking about how schools canceled in Tunisia, and there's some protests, but it's sporadic. There's no really clear explanation. Most of it was in Arabic. Within a week or two, I, or actually within a couple of days, it started to occur to me that that there was something serious happening. And it's not to say that I was the first person by, by no means, but I was the first person who was probably as perplexed as I was as to what was happening. Uh, within a couple hours, I was able to get on the phone with people, and sorry, rather Skype. <laughs> I was able to <laughs> Skype with people. Um, and you know, really kind of get a sense of, okay, well, Libyan State TV says school's canceled because this guy set himself on fire and the protests are spreading. And then I contacted this guy who was at the hospital, and forgive me, I've forgotten the name, but where uh, a lot of people started to be rushed to right when the violence started to kind of erupt. And all of a sudden, I started, you know, immediately doing what we were asked to do for the show, which is kind of compare it and contrast it with what was happening on the mainstream news. And it's not to say there was nothing. I mean, there was mention of the fact that he burned himself, but there was no context and there was no follow-up on the story. And I don't know, I mean, there's several reasons for that, I think. So often in the U.S., uh, you know, when we talk about dissent or protest or civil unrest in the Arab world, it's often through the, through the kind of uh, lens of, you know, either political ideology or religious ideology or political division, and, you know, Shiite, Sunni, and so on and so forth. And none of that really existed. So the story was kind of happening on Twitter. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, um, there was this kind of outpouring of stuff that you could, I had a tweet deck, which is essentially, for those of you who don't know, you can monitor, rather than do a search query, you can just monitor stuff. So I'll wrap it up and by saying that it just started to ping, 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 and I started to see more conversations happen between people in Egypt before the mainstream media, before much of the media was covering what was happening in Tunisia, there were already solidarity protests in Egypt. 
uh, and elsewhere, London, Berlin, Lausanne, I mean really bizarre places across the world. And, and this is, this is kind of tells you that then the local media in these places start to cover the story and that's how the story emerged to me. And that's how certain patterns started to emerge with regards to Egypt. And I think Egypt, you know, Wael Ghanim at the time was very smart in, in the way he approached it. He, he made sure to, to, to kind of use Tunisia as a kind of testing ground and, and see how many people he could get to go out in solidarity for Tunisia. And it, it's just, it was an ex extremely important lesson to me that, you know, it's not just, there's many reasons as to why the mainstream media was behind. I think we're all catching up. We're all realizing the power of these tools. Um, and so, yeah. So, um, I think it's a, it's a really important point that the relationship between opposition, regime, and technology has been different in every yeah. country so far, and it's likely to be different in any future countries where they're, you know, with this interplay continues. So I want to talk about a few other places. And Nazila, so let's talk a little bit about Iran going forward and how you, how you think things might develop. Do you think social media changes the equation there because, as we said, it was a year and a half ago and there were many fewer people on it? Or are there some other technologies and the relationship of people who are unhappy with the government there that may play out in an interesting way. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not really asking you to forecast the future. I guess I'm asking you to, you know, to tell us a little bit about the people you're in touch with there and what's sort of interesting in the way they may be going at things in the wake of Egypt and Tunisia. Well, what has happened in Egypt and Tunisia has definitely given a lot of confidence, not only to people in Iran, but uh, many other parts of the Middle East, so that's one thing for sure. And uh, from what we are hearing is that the Iranian government is really working hard to crack down on internet, and uh, very soon it's going to become more like an intranet inside the country than uh, people being able to even use the software that they have been using so far to circumvent the restrictions. Uh, so th the picture for, for internet in Iran is not very, uh, very optimistic now. Uh, but just to get back to what uh, Ahmad and Jacob just said, that uh, a lot, I mean, people do not go out on the streets in their running shoes in hundreds of thousands because of a message on Twitter or Facebook or because of a post on a blog. They really need much stronger motivations mm -hmm. for that. And like in 1979 in Iran, there, there were no Inter there was no internet, no Twitter. People were going out because of the cassette tapes that were being distributed at nights among people. Uh, it, it, people get the message somehow. I mean, it's either the internet, it's either the radio, or it's just printed, printed on papers and distributed. I'm just going to give you an example. After Iran expelled all foreign journalists and banned reporters from going out on the street, uh, I dared to go out. Uh, on, on one Tuesday, they, they had, the Iranians had said that, uh, the, the protesters had said that they will gather in a square in downtown Tehran called Badia Square. About two hours before they were supposed to start their demonstration there, uh, the pro-government forces announced that they would go to the same place to stage a pro-government rally. So it was highly believed that they were going to hijack uh, the event and or they were looking for a confrontation with the protesters. The internet was shut down. The SMS, the text messaging service was shut down. Mobiles were not working very well in the area where people holding demonstrations. I went down there and uh, there were a lot of people just sitting on the sidewalks and in front of shops. The pro-government forces were there uh, in huge numbers. And then after a while, people started whispering to one another. And uh, I mean, people were approaching me like they were carrying uh, diapers uh, or melon just to be disguised, not as protesters. And they were just saying Vanak Square. And that was like another square about two miles north of the square. And uh, I stayed there. I stayed there and I started talking to pro-government forces, to a commander. And then suddenly, like about after half an hour, uh, some of his guys and came and told him that there were, there were a lot of people in Vanak Square and that they were all going that way. By the time I got to Van Ack Square, there were hundreds of thousands of people there. And the only medium that they had used was just word of, yeah. word of mouth. Yeah. And people kept coming out. The text messaging service was down in Iran for over a month. Eventually, the government started because it was losing a huge amount of money. 
again on one of these days that uh, uh, the journalists had been expelled from the country, uh, one of these opposition television channels had a program and was teaching people how to use their mobile phones to shoot videos. And it was telling them that they should hold it with one hand and hold the other hand just like a tripod <laughs> under the elbow. The yeah. next day I went out, and again it was a huge demonstration. Uh, for miles the streets were filled with people, and thousands of people were standing on the curb just in the same posture. <laughs> <laughs> just like soldiers with their own weapon. And the videos were posted on the internet. The internet was slowed down to a crawl. It was really hard to get them posted, but people were finding ways. And if you look at it, it's, I mean, there are so many different mediums that have been involved. Internet probably had like a small share. It was a platform where everything was posted and other mediums were picking and amplifying the message. And people were not out there just because of what had happened uh, during the election, because the election was stolen. It was the result of anger and frustration mm -hmm. that had been simmering beneath the surface for years, for over 20 years. Yeah, Ahmed, you I, yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, these revolutions, some people try to like kind of highlight or overstate the importance of social tools. I think what they've done is they've really amplified and accelerated the speed at with which revolutions can take place. Because when you were saying that text messaging or, or you know, they were using cassette tapes, that would, t would have taken a lot longer. And so the, essentially the role of these tools is just to accelerate and amplify and offer a multitude and an exponential, an exponential way like number of ways in which people can come together, collaborate, and try and perpetuate whatever message it is they're trying to send. And I think it's also important to mention that this is, in a lot of, in a lot of senses, more of a popular uprising than anything else. And that's also something that allows the, the message to amplify and to kind of grow. Because, you know, if you find common ground and you kind of champion that message as opposed to something that could potentially divide people, um, that's something, I think that's one of the reasons why for so long, even though, as you say, you know, the, the region has been ripe for revolution for so long. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, this, this could have started to happen, and the reason it didn't is because of all the fear, obviously. But I think people who were active and people who were activists, whether online or whether on the street, you know, it's also worth mentioning in Egypt and Tahrir Square, they were using word of mouth towards the end. Um, you know, there was fear that, you know, everyone was kind of getting fatigued. Um, I imagine like us as journalists, I think thought, okay, you know, it's the third speech, like Ben Ali, three speeches and you're out. <laughs> you know, it was, he gave his third speech, right? So we all thought he'd leave, but he didn't leave. And so I think, you know, people just used, I heard reports um, from some of our reporters in Egypt that said, you know, people just resorted to some of the 1.0 social media tools, which is don't leave, come back. Yeah, no, I, I, I think we, uh, Ahmed emphasizes very well the role of social media as, you know, speeding things up as a mobilizing tool, but it's important in other ways as well. One is the legitimizing regimes. Social media is very effective in that. I mean, in the Philippines, we had an uprising in 2001, yeah. and a lot of it was, you know, there was reporting by the media and so on, but a lot of the, the legitimization of the present was due to jokes being passed around. Mm -hmm. Um, via, via, via mobile phones. Suddenly, you know, he became a laughable character. The president became a laughable mm -hmm. character. And people were making up their own jokes and the use of popular culture jokes, images like that was very important. Social media is a very important tool for that. The second is when the uprising does occur, social media is very good in reaching out to the other side, especially the soldiers, to say, don't shoot, mm -hmm. um, don't, don't join, don't join, don't defend this government, be on the people's side, because the speed with which social media is able to do that, and it's especially powerful if the soldiers get the messages from their mothers, their sisters, mm -hmm. you know, the, the women in, in their family who tell them, you can't shoot at your own people. So, you know, not just as yeah. a mobilizing tool, it's, it's important in, in other ways. Talk a little, if you would, about um, the Philippines today. You know, de democratic society, free press, free expression. But what role does this technology or other technology play in the political culture and in the development of civil society in a, in a post-revolutionary <coughs> situation? Well, um, activists and citizens um, very easily learn the new technology and use it for their own organizing, advocacy, um, things. So 
and unfortunately, politicians and governments learn, learn equally easily. This is, the new tools are very democratic. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what, what I want to say is that these moments of social media being dramatically influential as a mobilizing tool, they're moments, they're episodic. Mm -hmm. They don't happen every day. It takes you know, certain conjunctures, yeah. certain moments in history which lend them you know, wonderful or terrifying, depending on which side you're on, terrifying efficacy. But that's, that doesn't happen every day. Mm -hmm. You can't mobilize every day 100,000 or 200,000 yeah. people on the streets. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, well, which leads me to a question, actually, that I, I want to ask, ask you, which is, <laughs> is so I'm kind of going to jump do. into some kind of weird dual role here. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it, it, it has to do with, OK, you know, as, as social media, no doubt, had its role right. in Egypt in bringing about the fall of the regime. But now the next step is how do you build right. uh, an accountable democratic government and to what extent is technology, social media going to play a role in that and to what extent is it just good old fashioned coalition building, yeah. politics, legal reform, constitution writing, all of that stuff. Yeah. I think two ways I'll, I'll mention that, just two anecdotes very quickly is, uh, you know, Right now, the military is in power in Egypt, so to speak. And what they're doing is they have a Facebook page, page. And they're using the Facebook page to dictate their kind of responses to all the different groups that are trying to organize and have a say in the, in the, you know, the path forward, so to speak. And those groups, in amongst themselves, are also, um, you see you know, meetups that last until you know, <coughs> 2 in the morning with young girls, you know, uh, amongst men who you know, are strangers and all kinds of ages and there's about 60, 80 people and they, they are organized on Facebook often on different also social networking platforms within Egypt and they each get two minutes to speak and it's very organized and it's very, I mean, if anyone's lived in Egypt, Egypt is everything but organized. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's very interesting. That's one way. And then another way that I think it's quickly worth, something I wanted to mention about what um, Sheila was saying. Um, P.J. Crowley, who's the assistant to the Secretary of State, has a Twitter account, and he's all about tweeting. I mean, he tweets more than me. <laughs> and more than someone who works for us also named Dima Khatib, who's a Latin American correspondent. And even though she was not in Egypt during the revolution, sorry, I'm transgressing, but I think it's worth mentioning she had reached the maximum of 1,000 tweets a day, <laughs> and so she had to create a new account. Um, so that's essentially one tweet every two minutes, which I think makes you wonder. Those like, are the people you can't follow. Right? Yeah, <laughs> precisely. But it just shows you someone with a platform, a journalist, a correspondent at, at a mainstream network chooses to conduct herself in that way because she realizes the value of these tools. Quickly back to the PJ Crowley and forgive me for rambling. Um, I've been talking about, yeah, it's basically he, he when, when our journalists were detained, um, six of our journalists were detained and within I think an hour, PJ Crowley came out with a tweet that said something along the lines of, um, I think verbatim essentially, uh, the US government is extremely concerned about the detainment of Al Jazeera and he named Al Jazeera as reporters and they encouraged the Mubarak regime to release them immediately. I mean, you know, there were a lot of heads that were perplexed in the newsroom, but within 30 minutes, whether you can't really draw the causality per se, but within 30 minutes, our journalists were, were detained. And so this goes back to your question. I mean, you see now governments across the world, within the region as well, using social media tools in order to essentially dictate foreign policy. Um, and we recently saw Hillary Clinton, you know, m talk about Al Jazeera, but also talk about the revolutions and the power of media and how the U.S. is falling behind. And I think that's some, some place where the U.S. can protect at least, you know, the availability and access to information and online tools. And I think that's something that yeah. we might see investment in. So, Rebecca, I want to ask you about China, and then we're going to open it up for questions. But China, which you know a lot about, is a very interesting, very different story here. There's no Facebook in China. Right, right it's the Facebook and it's blocked, mm -hmm. um, and you know the, the, uh, the in terms of the state of the art government response mm -hmm. to a lot of these potential technologies, China's China's a good example of it. Yeah. How do you see any of this playing out there? Well, uh, as if you work as a journalist for any length of time in China, you learn that only people who've not lived in China make predictions about yeah. the future in China. <laughs> um, but, uh, so to talk about kind of 
past and present. Or talk uh, about the. But yes, no, yeah. no. But but just to talk about the situation and how China. I mean, I I've started to use a ter term called networked authoritarianism to to describe what is happening in China today because you have an authoritarian regime that has really adapted and evolved for the internet age. Um, you you have. Block, you know, you have many levels. You have blocking of international websites, so Facebook and Twitter and everything is blocked. You know, there are some people who have the technical skills to get around it, but it's kind of a, a very small community of kind of the usual suspect, highly political people um, or people with lots of, of foreign contacts. And so most people in China are using, uh, you know, there's something called Renren, Ren, which is a social media site that's about to list on the stock exchange here. Um, you know, you, you, you have Chinese versions of YouTube and so on. And all these companies are expected by the government to censor political content, shut down groups that are getting politically active, and report on what their users are doing. Um, so a lot of the censorship and surveillance is outsourced to the private sector. It's deputized to the private sector. Um, and uh, that's, you know, a sort of cautionary model, um, yeah. you know, and so it, it kind of flies in the face of declarations that some people make is all, all you need to do to free a society is to give it the internet. And what, what China shows is that it's much more complicated that that the government also, I mean, it's not that they control everything all the time, mm -hmm. but they control enough that you cannot successfully use the internet to form an opposition party that can successfully do something. Meanwhile, you allow people to use the internet to organize against the local corrupt official who harassed a young girl and get him fired. And then so people feel more empowered. They feel like they do have more freedom than they did 20 years ago. So that also kind of releases the pressure for total Overthrow. Of course, China is also very different because it's kind of bought off its population over the past couple of decades, and people's lives have improved greatly. People do have a lot more feeling of opportunity and, and have a lot more to lose in China mm -hmm. than the average young person uh, in in urban Egypt yeah, or, or Tunisia. So there's there's lots of of differences, and China also kind of recognizes, you know, they need networks, they need connectivity in order to be a global powerhouse. So increasingly, like one piece of news just over the past 24 hours is that the Chinese government is experimenting with a new method to kind of monitor cell phone networks in a much more finely grained way to kind of track people. And, and you know, that's been possible for a while, but just figuring out how to consolidate it better, basically. And so what happens is, is that you don't have to shut off the f cell phone networks. You just make it so that people are so scared that anything they transmit uh, or anything they say, or you know, their activities, they're so right. trackable that you're gonna have to leave your cell phone at home if you're gonna go to a protest, <laughs> because yeah. it's all gonna be kind of traced Very, yeah, on, right. on the network. And so, so I know a lot of people actually now who before going to a meeting with peop other people who are of interest to the authorities, everybody agrees we're leaving our cell phones at home. So. Repression yeah, doesn't need to, to be 100 percent effective to be very effective. Yeah. 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 Let me, um, if anyone has a question, please put your hand up while I ask Rebecca a follow-up about mm -hmm. just that, which is, can you imagine China unblocking Facebook, and can you imagine Facebook making the concessions the Chinese <laughs> government would demand mm -hmm. to be unblocked? <laughs> uh, it's hard to imagine China unblocking Facebook unless Facebook were to agree to adhere to the same standards of <coughs> control and censorship that Chinese companies adhere to. Um, you know, so a, a, unless there's a major shift in the way the Chinese government handles everything, um, I, I don't see unblocking it. Um, as far as Facebook is concerned, I certainly do not claim to understand what happens in Mark Zuckerberg's head. Um, so, uh, y you know, <laughs> I, I can't really say. Uh, but if Facebook, I mean, if Facebook were to take some version of Facebook into China, they, they'd have to agree to, you know, shut down any groups that, you know, and, and so if, if you're, if they created some kind of local version of Facebook, it couldn't be connected to the global Facebook because, Which would you know, defeat the purpose what, what of if it somebody who's member of a, you know, free Tibet 
Facebook group friends you right. if you're a Chinese person using the Chinese version, that, that's like the beginning of the end. So, yeah. so it would have to be completely balkanized. So um, what some people think w will happen, yeah. um, you know, and again, I'm not, you know, saying this with any internal knowledge, but some people think it's possible that Facebook may do a joint venture, say with Baidu or something, to set up some Chinese-run social network that Facebook invests in that's separate or something like that. Um, and another thing is that the other speculation that goes on is that Facebook's much more likely to go aggressively into places like Russia right. long before uh, right. they would go into China uh, directly because that's, that's a completely different kettle of fish in terms of how it's handled. Um, it certainly doesn't take in the lower classes, many of whom are illiterate in that part of the world, and they certainly don't own cell phones and they don't know the first thing about Twitter. And the economy has got to go down now because everything is uh, in flux. And so when it goes down, the first people it's going to hit are those lower classes. And sitting in the background is the Muslim Brotherhood that are handing out bread, and that's what the lower classes need, while everybody else is Twittering or whatever else they're going to do. So I'd like to know what it is you see for the future, because I don't see it as such a rosy future. I see it if, as if you look at the economy, that it's a very potentially uh, an unsettling future. And with the, with the military in place yeah. in Egypt, I'm not sure there's been a major change. The only thing that happened was an 81-year-old man left. Uh, um, and I think that's the question for you. I I'll, think I'll be very you. brief yes, because, because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak, you know, on, this is my opinion. But I think it is a tenuous situation with the military in power, you're right. Um, but sometimes things hap have to happen in stages. Um, so if the Muslim Brotherhood does come to power, and I hope this isn't blasphemy, uh, then the Muslim Brotherhood has to come to power. And I'm not saying that because I want the Muslim Brotherhood to come to power, but my point is sometimes in order to get to true democracy, you, or to true, to, you know, it, 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 may, it may serve people well to try, like for example, part of the organizing on Twitter and Facebook is not just to talk about things, they're actually trying to organize and respond to things like you're saying, where the Muslim Brotherhood's giving out bread. Well, what are we going to do to win over the people? So the tools can still play a role. You still, you still seem extremely skeptical. I think you might be yes, more skeptical I now that I mentioned the Muslim yes. Brotherhood might come to power. Ma'am, just, I just we have quite a few people it's, in back of you, so just one sometimes question. Sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. Is ultimately what yeah, I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Michael Rand, and uh, my question is. Uh, given all that you said, what should we do next, and what would you recommend the Obama administration do next? Is that for anyone in particular? Okay. Who wants to go? Who wants to go at that? Go? Yes, please. Well, I think uh, the Obama administration, the best thing that it can do is to lift all kinds of sanctions uh, that restrict access to information. Libya is under sanctions right now. Iran is under sanctions right now. Over Iran, there is int satellite internet, but Iranians cannot access it. Iranians cannot buy Skype credits even to talk on Skype telephone lines because of sanctions. Uh, so if technology is really helpful for yep. people to communicate, mm -hmm. use them, uh, th th the most destructive uh, right now are the sanctions, at least to the Iranians. Uh, Iranians have been able to find ways to cir circumvent uh, the, the restrictions that are imposed by the government, but uh, the hardest part are the ones imposed by the outside world. Yep. Thanks. We'll just try to get a couple more questions in sure. here. Do you think even Moglin's efforts are good or bad? To who's? Does Ibn yes. Danny, can you, can you, actually, that's really interesting. Can you yeah. briefly explain about what Ibn Moglin is doing? Um, <laughs> Sorry. Certainly. Um, I, so if I, I can't. Ebba Moglin, a uh, former general counsel for a thing called the Free Software Foundation, which enabled a lot of the tools that um, uh, built the internet, I think is fair to say, has been trying to uh, uh, fund and encourage a movement to create non-centralized systems for the future internet. So. Rather, than, you, you may notice that in our conversation about how revolutions are formed, uh, connected to the internet, we use a lot of trademarked terms right now. We say Skype, TM, Facebook, and Twitter. 
And the older generation of, of the internet was email and instant messaging and non-trademark terms. So what Eben, Eben is trying to do is to create tools that you would have on your phone or um, in your house or, um, uh, and distributed in a decentralized way that would give you all the facilities and capabilities that are currently being very well provided um, but centrally provided by um, by Facebook and, uh, and Twitter and these companies. I, th I think the strongest point that he's made is that, you know, any revolution can, can be stopped if it's, if it's using Facebook, if somebody makes an offer to Mark Zuckerberg that he can't refuse. <laughs> and and um, the, 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 the push here is, I think, I think it's called the Freedom Box, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, the attempt here is to create tools that, that y you'd have to go one by one to six billion of social networks and ask them one by one to shut down rather than just one central. Rebecca, you, you already have a freedom box, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, just, uh, just on this question of, you know, what should the U.S. be doing or what yeah. should the Obama administration be doing, um, I, I like to quote a Egyptian software programmer and activist, Allah Abdel Fattah, who you might know, and yeah, who some of us knew, know, uh, who was actually interviewed by another blogger, Tunisian blogger, Sami Ben Garbia, about just that kind of question, what should the role of the United States and other actors be? And Alas said, look, you know, the best thing the United States and other democracies can do is lead by example and get your own house in order mm -hmm. and, in, in term, and, and do everything you can to ensure <coughs> that networks globally, <coughs> you know, that that, that you're setting up the right regulatory examples, that it just in, in terms of how private networks and, and government control interacts, that you're not setting up excuses uh, for, for authoritarian regimes to copy because they say, oh, well, you know, the Americans are doing this anyway, and more and more European governments are, are using internet filtering to block things they don't like, so therefore we can do the same thing, that, that really it's, leading by example is extremely important. He said that's much more important than money, is to show how do you properly balance the need for security and fighting crime on the one hand with the need for protection of civil liberties on the other, and how do you balance that properly and, and, and really you know, show the way rather than just lecture? I, if I can just quickly, I want to qualify the previous answer. I think the answer to this, for me to put it simply, is protect access to information at home and then hope that that will happen uh, abroad. Uh, but uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood question, I just feel like it's important to clarify that I think what we've seen and a lesson to be learned from the revolutions is that change is, is best when it comes from within. And for decades, the U.S. government and other organizations have been trying to promote and bring democracy probably in good spirit and in good vein. But I think it becomes extremely problematic when if democracy is allowed to flourish, if, if someone comes to power that is problematic, that then you completely undermine the entire process of democracy. What you have to do, I think, is hope hope that humanity will eventually prevail. And if someone does come to power that's worse than the previous leader, then eventually the, it'll self-correct, hopefully in due time, in short time. Great. So we have three questions. We're going to get them in in the last five minutes. So quick questions. All right. Uh, quick, quick question, which is a what should journalists do question. Uh, clearly, in the last couple of months, we have entered the billion broadcaster universe. Everybody with a cell phone can be a news channel for as long as they can sustain audio or video programming. Now, of course, the problem with this is provenance. Uh, in addition to what's going on, journalists are supposed to ask who is saying so and what are their interests that might shape what they're saying. The anonymity that is presently largely inherent in the Internet calls into question the whole sourcing question. And so my question to anybody on the panel who would like to tackle it is, how must journalists adapt to this new, very, very slippery information universe. I would say Sheila or Nazila, you, either of you want to go with that. Yeah. I, I think you just have to accept that journalism is going to be committed by everybody. And, yeah. and, but, but that there's still a special role for professional journalists, which is as you say, you know, to verify information, to contextualize information, to dig up information in the case of investigative journalists that is, remains hidden and that most citizen journalists don't have the resources or the c 
capability to do. I think journalism will continue to have a place, but uh, professional journalism that is, but it will no longer have a monopoly of the information space. You have to share that space with yeah. others. <coughs> Great. Go, go right ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Noah Arjum. I'm actually a former CPJ uh, intern. Uh, my question, it, it seems like one of the things I'm getting from this is that the diaspora communities are, especially in Europe and the US, are able to play a much greater role uh, and are much more connected to these, uh, this last wave of revolutions that's been going on. I'm curious to what extent, or if, if you think these protest movements, these revolutions have been reshaped in ways that they wouldn't have been uh, if they were purely homegrown by these uh, expatriate groups. And also, if, because you have all these people tweeting or blogging as whatever, as Egyptians or Iranians who are actually outside of the country and presumably have a different perspective or aspiration. So, go ahead. No, no, please. Finish. Yeah, if you think that changes the understanding of the revolution. I, I think it, of course it does. I mean, it, it goes from becoming a conversation, a conversation with multi-nodes to kind of just one pe people talking and hoping that other people will listen. And I think uh, there's certain expertises, you know, er, people who are living abroad in the dias diaspora have certain areas of expertise as in how to relay messages to the media, how to get the mainstream media's attention, which is, as, as I think Sheila just said, an extremely important role as well. Uh, one thing I think that's worth mentioning is a lot of uh, people, okay, 69% of the Arab world are under the age of 30. Uh, that's huge. And uh, there's a big problem with the brain drain in countries like Lebanon and in Egypt. And I think as a result of these revolutions, you're starting to see for the first time that Egyptians that are young, that are abroad, that have certain skills or language skills or, you know, whatever, that have certain experiences that they can then bring back to Egypt are actually starting to go back. And I think that's as a result of the fact that they were so active and so um, involved with the actual revolution. So that's just one kind of, you know, manifestation of how important it was for that, them to participate in all this. If I can just throw, throw very quick, quickly in, I mean, one of the, 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 the groups that, that CPJ deals with a lot is, is journalists who've been um, uh, essentially run out of their, their own countries for their reporting and they find themselves as journalists in exile. And there was a time when that, that I mean, it still is a very hard life to lead, but, but it gains a special importance and a special capability in these times when you have been reporting on these things for a very long time in, in, in um, uh, perhaps relative obscurity, but certainly more safety. Um, and, uh, and the technology, technology does enable that as well, right? The technology enables you to run, you know, a, a site where you're doing genuine reporting outside of the country. The, those, those groups are still very vulnerable and we still work very hard to, to protect them and, and they need that protection. But I think their power is growing as a result of sort of the international ability of uh, uh, the global capability of the technology. You have the last question, so make it a really good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Simone Foxman. I'm a senior here at CC. Um, and um, today, in both of the panels, they talked about the over um, like the, how, uh, how we sensationalize the use of Twitter and Facebook in the, rec the recent political uprisings in the Middle East. Um, <coughs> but do you think this has any positive repercussions in the sense that people in the United States um, can see people abroad as um, people just like them who are using media tools and or even just as media consumers or consumers in general? Please, Rebecca, go ahead. Sure. Well, as co-founder of something called Global Voices, which kind of uses the internet to kind of help people see each other as people. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's not to say that, oh, you know, because it was over sensationalized, the role should be completely discounted. You know, that, that's not the point. Mm -hmm. the point. The point is that, yeah, I mean, you're certainly seeing within Twitter uh, people really understanding what, what people on the ground in Egypt and Tahrir Square are really thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's much more personal and personalized and, and ties are made. That's that's really you know that that's that's a very different thing. But I, I think it is really important, um, and and one reason why some of us kind of harp on the over sensationalizing is again this is not this is about people. This is not it's not the technology that's the hero. It's the people. And why why is that important? Um, it's important because. If we overemphasize the technology as 
the reason why everything's great, I think people stop taking responsibility for their individual mm -hmm. actions. Right. Companies stop taking responsibility for the specifics of what they do mm -hmm. because they say, oh, well, the Internet's making everybody free anyway, so you know, whether or not I do this or that with my privacy policy doesn't really matter mm -hmm. because that's, that's like acceptable collateral damage for the greater good <laughs> I'm doing because I'm spreading the Internet. Um, <laughs> and, and similarly, you know, uh, you know there there is something to be be said again. You know, Evgeny Morozov. Different people have different views about his book, but he does. You know, he, it's a very useful critique about policy making. And let's not be naive about you know all you need to do is get activists on Facebook and Twitter, and you know, mm -hmm. and put your diplomats on Twitter, and everything's going to change. The same hard problems remain the same hard problems, and human nature has not changed. And everybody has to take, you know, again, it, it comes down to local circumstances and human nature and all kinds of things that well, remain as tough as they've always been. I just wanted to quickly add that uh, here on our new show, The Stream, we're partnering with people like Global Voices Online. I hope you know that. <laughs> um, and, and by the way, our managing editor, Solana uh, Larson, yeah. is right there. Okay, okay, you know. And the reason I mention this is just quickly because, uh, you know, part of what we're trying to do is to empower and, and give people a platform, people and their voices a platform, people who otherwise don't, and that's a big part of Al Jazeera's mission, and Global Voices does that, and we're using, I just came back from a trip to San Francisco, so I haven't convinced my bosses to pay me and have me be, be there permanently like you, <laughs> but um, I'm figuring it out, but the point is, you know, I came back from a trip where we met with companies like Storify, uh, and I think it's worth mentioning, there's these kind of new tools, not just Facebook, Twitter, and the ones we all know, but that are curation tools and aggregating tools, which kind of highlight that, that mission of trying to, you know, give one individual, as Sheila mentioned, the power to create a story using sources. So that also goes to that question about sources. I mean, sure, we might not know what the, the source is, but the idea is that's going to be a big part of our show, trying to allow people the opportunity to not just contribute to storytelling, but eventually be on the show and, and talk about it. So I think there's a clear lesson, which is that you should be following all of these people on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, if, um, if you actually follow me at Jacob Wee, I will make sure that all of their Twitter handles are in one message, and you can follow them all very easily, rather than have them try to sound out their... And as a side effect, know. they'll end up following you. Well, so if, your, that your happens, will go if that happens, it happens. Uh, <laughs> The, I think uh, we, everyone is invited to have a more informal conversation over wine and cheese in the hall, and Josh is going to wind it up. Well, that's what I was going to say. No, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> to reiterate, it doesn't, I don't think you need too much persuasion. I can try to summarize what we said. Should I try that? Sure. It was very, conf <laughs> because it was complicated. Yeah. Uh, I think what we learned is that there is a very complex web of controls that governments use against social media. It's not a very simple thing. It's not like putting a journalist in jail alone. And it's very difficult to combat that. That there really was not a uh, one-size-fits-all explanation of social media and the various uh, Arab upheavals in uh, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Iran, non-Arab, Iran, Persian, <laughs> Iran, but Middle East. <laughs> uh, and so we shouldn't look for that in the future, probably. Uh, that the Chinese seem to have, have, have figured it out pretty well. Uh, that social media, uh, the changes aren't that different from what earlier social media institutions like radio have done, but they accelerated tremendously. That social media alone doesn't make revolutions. Uh, you need to be organized if you're using Twitter, but that it, it helps to have it. Uh, and that it yet is extremely helpful sometimes with the example that Ahmed gave about uh, PJ Crowley twittering and getting six Al Jazeera guys out in a half an hour. So uh, it actually, at the Committee to Protect Journalists, I think, makes our job a lot better, a lot easier, and a lot more effective. So uh, this has been a really uh, valuable panel for us, because this is the direction that we're trying to go in at the Committee to Protect Journalists. And 
uh, some of the people here are on our board. You can see that uh, they're extremely engaged in, in helping us figure out how to do that. And I want to thank everybody, including the rest of you, uh, for this. Join us for a drink. <laughs>